we will be using phylogenetic trees as a way to navigate and figure out how we fit into life on Earth. But if you're going to use phylogenetic trees, you better understand your model. You better understand the weaknesses and the strengths. So for example, if we use this wonderful tree as a model of all life on Earth, then all of the species that are alive today on Earth are the tips of the branches. And all of the branches are the evolutionary pathways through which those species have evolved. And if a species goes extinct, well then its branch falls off. And the branches near the top that diverge near the top, well those are species that are related very closely, like humans and chimpanzees. And if we have branches that diverge further down, well those are less closely related, like humans and bananas, or humans and this tree itself. And right here at the base of the tree is the ancestor of all life, the common origin of us all. Mm. <laughs> we will be using phylogenetic trees to navigate through our past and try to determine how we got here. The earliest trees, here are two of the earliest trees. In uh, Charles Darwin, in his notebook in 1837, wrote up here, I think, and then he drew this little picture. And this picture is of species or genuses, genera, diverging from each other and diverging. So this is the first example of a phylogenetic tree applied to the understanding of the ancestors of life forms. A few decades later, a Darwin fan, Ernst Haeckel, in 1866, produced this tree, in which it really looks like a tree now, doesn't it? And here we have plants in this group. Then we have protista, which are single-celled critters. And then we have animals over here. And this is just the first attempts at trying to use a tree to understand our ancestry. Now, genetic distance, like between an elephant and a kangaroo, or between a human being and a chimpanzee, is not a one-dimensional or two-dimensional, it's a multi-dimensional distance. But in order to represent it as a phylogenetic tree, we have to project that n-dimensional distance onto two-dimensional space or one-dimensional space. And here are examples of that. So here we have a two-dimensional tree on the left and a one-dimensional tree on the right. Now, it would be great to have three, four, five-dimensional trees, but that would be harder to project. Time, of course, is going from the bottom to the top. Now, speaking of time, you'll see a whole variety of different types of trees. On the tree on the left, time goes vertically. The tree in the center, we have horizontal time. And the tree on the right, time starts in the middle and then goes radially, where the present is at the outer circumference. Now, here's a tree which has both radial time and branch length as the radial. Now, branch length essentially means genetic distance from the origin. In this tree, all the, the, the names of the species you can see in the color around the edge are all the same distance from the center. But each of those species is connected to the center by a thin gray line, but also a thick gray line. The thick uh, dark line is the one that is an estimate of how much genetic distance is there between that particular species and the center, the origin. Now, that's the same tree as now on the left, where it, it shows branch length and time as the radial coordinate. On the tree on the right, we don't have any time. We just have uh, branch length. And you can see things that evolved a lot and things that haven't evolved much from the, from the center. Now, you can make a tree based on species, as the one on the right, but you can add to that subspecies. And that's what appears on the right. Tree on the left is a, sub, is a species tree. Tree on the right is a species tree with subspecies added. Now, for example, here there are human beings in both trees. Here are the chimpanzees in both trees. Here are the gorillas. And here are the orangutans. The orangutans diverge from the other great apes in this red spot. Now, we want to take a look at how this, what it means to add subspecies. So let's take a look at modern humans and how these different groups of humans start to diverge a little bit from each other, but can still, are still not sexually isolated from each other. They can still interbreed. So let's take a, another closer look. So here's some typical species on the left who then diverges in the green spot into two species. If we zoom in on that, it looks something like this, in which 
the width of the lines. Now it's, they're not infinitely thin lines, they have a certain width, and that width represents the genetic diversity within the species. Then the, during a time of 2 to 10, maybe even 20 million years, depending on the species that's diverging, you have a period of hybridization where different subgroups can interbreed their subspecies, but eventually, because they're, they're being drifted apart or because there's a mountain range or something in between them or a river, then they become sexually isolated and can no longer, inter longer interbreed. Now, there are different rates of change in a phylogenetic tree. In the tree on the left, we have gradual evolution in which, in which the red line is almost vertical. It deviates only a little bit. But on the tree on the right, it represents almost instantaneous evolution in which the red line boom, goes off to the left and boom, goes off to the right, etc. So there are different rates of evolution, and that can be indicated on these trees. Now, here is a tree with endosymbiosis. So we have the domains, the three domains, eubacteria, eukaryote, and archaea. We are eukarya, and you can see animals in the middle there. Now, endosymbiosis is a process in which a free living organism gets incorporated into the body of another organism. So, for example, alpha proteobacteria got incorporated into early eukaryotes, and they moved over to the right, and all of the eukaryotes have these mitochondria in them. Matter of fact, they're the organelles in every cell in your body which allows you to breathe oxygen and uh, burn the food that you eat and get energy. There's also another endosymbiotic uh, event that happened, and that's when cyanobacteria, bacteria capable of photosynthesis, got endosymbiotically incorporated into early plants, and that allows current plants to perform photosynthesis. It's a bacterial invention that got incorporated into a larger multicellular organism. Now, the tree on the top is kind of simple, but it's probably wrong. And Doolittle decided, you know what, I'm going to fix this. And you can see at the bottom of the tree on the bottom, you have a lot more horizontal gene transfer going on, left and right and left and right, lots of exchanges. Genes are being exchanged not too dissimilarly from the way we exchange ideas. So if you're interested in this idea of horizontal gene transfer, which probably was an important mode of, of transfer of information in the early life, have a look at this Susie et al. review article in 2015. Now, on the tree on the left, we have divergences only. We have two lines coming from one line. But on the tree on the right, we have divergences and convergences. Convergences is when two in formerly independent lines come together and merge into a single organism or even a single ecosystem, depending on how you want to talk about the units of evolution. Now, is the phylogenetic tree of life or is it a phylogenetic bush of life? In a tree model, we have a limited amount of diversity at the bottom that diverges into two, diverges into five, and then at the top we have seven. So the number of independent lineages increases with time. In the Bush model on the right, we have an incredible amount of radiation at the bottom, producing seven or eight different uh, species or groups, and then they stay pretty much the same. And that's the Bush model. We're not quite sure which of these models is more correct. Sometimes maybe life acts like a tree, maybe it acts like a bush. Also, I feel a little bit embarrassed that we haven't included viruses in these trees. Here's an attempt to include viruses. Those are these lines, squiggly lines, that are everywhere, that are part of the life of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, and possibly played an important role in the RNA world, which could be considered to be a viral world. Now, there's a warning. When you look at these trees, there's all, it's easy to be misled. Phylogenetic trees can be very misleading. The common themes of how you will be misled is the people who make the trees is, have thought my group is better or more evolved than your group. I'm betterism. Or my group is more important and is almost the only group worth including. So there's examples of this everywhere in the literature, particularly in the popular science literature. Here's one example of a racist tree. You can see the, the Greek-looking statue on the right is supposed to be better than everything else or more evolved. And you can see that we're supposed to be more evolved than fish or opossums. Now, you can also say, hey, my species is the best. That Not only the racist tree on the left, but how we have a species tree in which I call the Schwarzeneggerization of life because the human being in the center at the top 
Looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, a muscle building kind of guy. And you can see because there's a straight line from the origin of life all the way to Arnold Schwarzenegger that Arnold Schwarzenegger was the purpose of life. Now, that's the best species in the world, we human beings. Also, almost everything in that tree is an animal. But there are some plants on the right and fungi and other forms of life do not even appear. Now here's a tree. Look at the part on the right. It's called animals. And you see the red crown at the top. That red crown is making mammals the king. So mammals are obviously better than the other life forms. Yes, mammals are great. <laughs> now here's a tree. I call it an animalist tree because the idea is animals are better or more evolved or more diverse than the other kingdoms of organisms. And therefore more of them should appear or show up on the tree. As a matter of fact, if you divide this tree into the animals, there are the animals are on the right and everything else is on the left. So animals make up three. So we're, we are to imagine that animals make up three quarters of all life forms. Here's another one. Animals make up two thirds or three quarters of all life forms. That's all the, the organisms beneath the black line. But if you look at animals in a much more objective tree like the one on the right, and highlight in red where the animals are, this is what you get. The tree on the left, it's a gigantic two-thirds of all critters are animals, but on the right you can see that the animals are only a tiny fraction of the tremendous diversity of life that we have on this planet. Now also phylogenetic trees, it's not, it's not always easy to know exactly when two species came out of one, when there was a divergence. On the left, the assumption is made that these, these divergences are pretty well constrained by time, and so you only have divergences. When you have branching order that you're not quite sure of the times, then you have trivergences and quadrivergences, and you, have a, have a, you end up making a, a tree that looks like a porcupine, where all of the lines come out at the same t place because you, cannot, you do not have a branching order. Now, let's consider this phylogenetic tree. A, B, C, D, E, F. And let's consider the lineage along the right diagonal that led from the common ancestor to F. Now, there's the, on the top axis, the horizontal axis is the one-dimensional genetic variation and the vertical axis is time. We do not know exactly when C branched off from the lineage that led to F. We do not exactly know when B branched off to the lineage that led to F. And so those gray triangles represent the uncertainty. Notice that if the uncertainty is large enough, then B and C uncertainties overlap, which means that this is a possibility. It is possible that C diverged earlier and then B came in contradistinction to what we had earlier. Now, with that type of uncertainty, you could also, it could also be the case that C diverged with B from the lineage that led to F. And so we would have one fewer diver uh, divergent event on the way to F. So these are the types of uncertainties that you should keep in mind when we show you this type of tree. Although the lines are thin and the divergences are timed, uh, we're not quite sure of the exact order and the exact timing of these trees. So unlike this tree, phylogenetic trees are really representations of multidimensional genetic distances projected onto one or two dimensions for simplicity. And time in these trees can go up or down, ra right, left, or radially. And uh, endosymbiosis, which we know has occurred in life on Earth, is hard to represent here because branches of trees don't usually converge. Horizontal gene transfer, this exchange of genes, is hard to show. Also, if you want to distort some things, you, it's easy to distort trees. If, you're, if you want to create a racist tree, you can make, oh, my race is better than yours. If you want to create a speciesist tree, we say, my species is the most important. You can also create mammalist or animalist trees in which animals are all the diversity and everything else is over marginalized in a corner. Also, we haven't really included viruses. They're not easy to put into these trees. And Maybe trees aren't so good. Maybe a bush is a better model. It has a shorter trunk, it has more branches near the bottom, it's easy to hold. Oh, tree, bush, <laughs> I mean bush. And here are all the extant species. Not that many have gone extinct.